uh, Ron Lindsay. Ron's career spans Conrail, CSX, and working with uh, different technologies like positive train control and uh, other technology platforms. Uh, this should be very interesting. Uh, we're into the high-tech world now. Like I said before, it's not your grandfather's railroad anymore. And uh, Ron's going to go ahead and let us know all that's going on. So please welcome Ron Lindsay. I have to tell you, it's a real pleasure being here today. I, uh, I have 45 years in the industry, 33 or 34 of that is with class ones as chief engineer for Conrail and advanced train control for CSX. And the other nine, 10 years will have been in the countries of Kazakhstan, Egypt, and Ukraine. In other words, I've been on this side of what a railroad is, and as you'll see, I've been on the other side of what a railroad could be. And what I'm going to talk about today actually came out as a result of, uh, I was a developer of the first PTC system when I was at CSX. And as a result of that, I was asked to develop PTC for a couple other countries. And one, as you'll see in my presentation, once I got there, I realized you can't do that. They needed a different type of traffic control system. And that's why I designed something called VCTC, Virtual CTC. Now, Virtual CTC, Oh, there it is. It is, in a sense, a part of virtual railroading. And where's the flip? This thing here? That's not The green button? Oh, that thing. That was enormous. Okay, good. Impaired, uh, if you can really kind of identify virtual railroading as a paradigm shift in operating a railroad both safely and efficiently without infrastructure, without the typical conventional infrastructure we all, most of us all know and well and really love it. We've, it's been around 100 years. Track circuits have been around 100 years. So what I'm going to do today is talk about what it is, why it's there, how it came about, where it is, and when will it be elsewhere. But I have to talk first about vitality. Vitality is a very difficult word for a lot of people. For some of us, it means, if the FRA means everything's vital. And about 15 years ago, when they had the RSAC, Railroad Safety Advisory Committee, for PTC, which was an attempt to identify what PTC was, I had already developed PTC. And when I had to present this to the RSAC group, and the FRA kept saying, that's vital. I said, it's not vital. Why is it vital? Well, to them, that meant there was something they could regulate and put constraints on, and that's what they like to do. I mean, they do a very good job. If you look at other countries across the world, they don't have an FRA, much to their disadvantage. So I'm not putting FRA down, but I'm saying sometimes there's constraints. So as a result of that, I defined um, Vital to be a process, a hardware, a person who creates the movement authority, not transmits the authority or delivers the authority, but that which creates it. This is really critical when you get around to designing systems that the FRA is going to review. So you have your typical uh, vitality issues, book of rules, timetable, train sheet, computerized conflict checker. We know those, and we also know track circuit and control point. Well, what I find out, as you'll see a little bit later, is that there's other ones. Uh, there's back office vitality. Some of you may be familiar with ETCS3, uh, European Train Control System, which is, has yet to be delivered, in my opinion. It's a moving block. That's back office vitality. You have token block, tokenless block. You're going to see what that is. And most of you, I'm sure, have never been exposed to it or dealt with it. But this is something that came out of the 1900s. You have gray crossing operator. These are what, what I call uh, nested authorities. Just like you have in CTC where you have an EIC, an employee in charge out there, the train has the authority to go through that, but he also has to get permission from the EIC. That's a nested authority. That guy's vital when he does that. And mechanical interlocking operators, which I suspect most of you have never seen, nor had I until I went to Egypt. So my point is vitality a very critical point of vitality is understanding it only creates the movement authority. 
So let's move on. So what is virtual railroad? It's the use, uh, use of virtual technologies, GPS, wireless data, in lieu of the physical infrastructure that we know today. VR, virtual railroading, is a concept starts with traffic control. In fact, I'm going to focus on two parts of virtual reality. It's a big picture. I'm not really going to go into virtual reality, or railroad, excuse me, but I'm going to talk about VCTC as a traffic control system that you need to go to virtual railroading. And then I'm going to talk to you about the most boring thing you could ever imagine, IT architecture. Have you ever been to a conference where they talk about IT architecture? Well, it is also in our, in, uh, across the globe, the railroads use an IT architecture is, that is also very antiquated. And in order to move forward with scheduled railroading or virtual railroading, you need to change the IT architecture, which I will go into a little bit later. So why VCTC or why virtual railroading? There are so many railroads out there. I mean, really, many, many railroads out there that uh, don't need the throughput of CTC, yet they are forced to take CTC or sometimes dark territory, but normally CTC or something like it because that's all suppliers have to offer. Suppliers don't want to offer a system that has no infrastructure. They don't have any revenue from that. They get no ongoing maintenance from that. So you don't see very many railroad, uh, excuse me, suppliers out there offering virtual CTC. Dark territory, as I grew up, that's where I developed PTC, was on dark territory. I've kind of known and love it. I really think it's great. And it's very safe. But it's not really known outside the US. So what so many railroads across the globe need is a low-cost, low-maintenance system. This is um, Egypt. This is the uh, Ramsey Station in Egypt. I wish that picture did this justice. But that facade for their main um, railroad is tens of millions of dollars. Wait till you see what kind of railroad they have. But they put this money into this building to impress the world about the railroad. And that's a shame. But my challenge was to develop PTC for this railroad. So let's take a look at that. If you look at ENR, in Egyptian National Railway's traffic control system, they have 80% uh, of what's called token, tokenless block. The other is CTC. Token block is you generate authority with these two machines. One of these machines is located to end each of the block. And you have a block operator there. Whoops, excuse me. How can I go back? Here we go. And see those things in the middle? Those are the tokens. Those are sticks of metal rods about that big. That is your movement authority. How do you transmit the authority? You stick it up on a pole, and a train comes by and picks it up, and then drops off. That token is only good for that individual block. So if you don't have that token for that block, you don't have any right to be there. Actually, it's pretty safe until um, the guy goes to the bathroom. And the train says, I've been down this path many times before. In fact, when I completed my study in Egypt, the week before I presented to the executive board, a guy had gone to the bathroom, a train went down and killed five people. So it's not always safe. And you all see that stuff I mean, from World War II, German movies, the trains, the strong arms, throwing switches. Look at that mechanical. I mean, the Egyptians are phenomenal mechanical linkage. This is a mechanical interrupt with a semicircle. Excuse me. So my challenge here was to develop a PTC system. And when you develop PTC, what PTC does is it looks at the characteristics of the movement authority. Looking back at what I just showed you, how do you pick up the characteristics of that stuff? You can't. You really can't. So that's why um, I designed v uh, VCTC, to eliminate all that infrastructure as far as along the wayside. So let's look at what it really is. Well, by the way, now that you're saying, why do you want to talk to us about Egypt? Let's see if I figure out how to go back here. Because after I finished Egypt, I got a similar task to go to Kazakhstan and develop PTC for them. They had CTC. They have 50-year-old Soviet bloc CTC that is literally falling apart. 
and they want a solution. So VCTC, yeah, I started with Egypt, but it applies to CTC. And that's what we designed for uh, pretty much the same thing we designed for Egypt. It's transparent. Anyhow, so what is it? CTC, as we all know and well and love it, there's all the components. We all know them very well. And VCTC, that all goes away. That all goes away. Now, you have to add some uh, monitoring devices for the switches. And you might have to put on in a train, not in a train like you all know and love it, to those that, you know, for monitoring um, the air pressure. In a train is simply a device, it may be the same device, but it's a device that sits at the end of the train and simply transmits its position. Because you notice there's no track circuit there. There's no way of knowing block occupancy except for the fact the front end is reporting its position and the back end is reporting its position, so now you have occupancy. Simple as that. You also notice there's no code line coming back to the office. That means you could be dispatching from here. Okay? There's no physical attachment to that rail or to that infrastructure. Hence, there's really no maintenance, right? Now you got the onboard device, you got a few wayside devices. This is not CPTC, by the way. Somebody asked me last night. It's not CPTC in the sense that if you're familiar with communication based train control, which is great for transits, it's also very expensive. Because with CPTC, you have wayside integrity, vitality. Uh, with CPTC, with VCTC, you have back office vitality. Think of it as, uh, for you that are familiar with auto routing on CTC, it's kind of like an auto routing for dark territory. Very inexpensive. CPTC also has those balises or tags, whatever you call it, along the wayside. This has nothing, VCTC has nothing like that. Okay? And VCTC provides for integrity because you have those EOT devices. Now, it's both fixed and virtual block. In a sense, it's kind of a poor man's version of uh, moving block. Same idea, but you're not pushing that type of throughput with VCTC. Believe me, let me tell you, VCTC is not for everybody. But it's for one hell of a lot of railroads out there. And it's for one hell of a lot of the class one corridors that are currently CTC or dark territory, DTC, TWS, I'm using these acronyms, um, that doesn't really meet the requirements for that railroad in the future. Train integrity is provided, as I mentioned. And um, as I mentioned, this also can go into, if you think about PTC, what it is, it's a go or go no situation, depending on the situation. Here in case of Egypt, the situation was that gray crossing guard there, did he lower the gate? Number two, is there a block operator, or excuse me, a mechanical operator who reset the home signal? In those cases, again, there were two accidents when I was there, it resulted in 55 uh, fatalities. And VCTC would have prevented those. But if there's any single engineers out here, they're going to say, well, wait a second, Ron, there's no broken rail protection. OK? Let's look at that. One half of the US freight railroad trackage in the US, roughly, is dark territory. One third of that is ABS, absolute block, which results in one third of the trackage in the US there's no track circuits. We have got that presence established in our country. If you look at European railroads, a lot of them have no track circuits. What I'm trying to do is, again, if the FRA here, they'd be, you know, shouting, hey, we got to have broken rail protection, okay? But pragmatically, we're not really doing it in a lot of part of our country. And for, if you don't have track circuits, there are other solutions. You can downgrade your track circuit. As an example, in KTC, if they install VCTC where they have CTC, they'll keep those track circuits in place. They just want to maintain them to the level for blockage, or for, uh, uh, for occupation. Or there's this new tech, relatively new technology. I, maybe some of you guys have met with Frosher. They're from uh, Vienna. They have this fiber optic stuff that is absolutely amazing. 
not only does it's a, you put a dark fiber along the wayside and it picks up on the acoustics of what's happening on that track and you can tell if there's broken rail, you can tell where the train is. In the Deutschbahn, I understand from a reliable source who has a tendency to make things up occasionally, tells me that the Deutschbahn is 100% using the fiber optics for broken rail protection, train position, and so forth. So there are other alternatives for those of uh, you who feel necessary. But the other point is there's a lot of discussion. When does the rail break? I mean, I've heard that for 15, 20 years. When does the rail break? It breaks under the train or is it some other time? If it breaks under the train, you've got detection. It's called derailment. Now, the core technologies. Here's what's, I'm going to make sure I don't over, okay, I've got to run here. When you look, as a, I'm a technologist, okay? I'm not a technician. I'm a guy who knows how to make a business case based upon technologies. And when I get involved with a situation, as with BCTC, I look at the three primary technologies that are required, communications, intelligence, and positioning. That's what it takes to move assets on a railroad, to do it accurately and efficiently. But what I've learned in the last five years, you never would have seen this, but the IT architecture that sits on top of that is absolutely critical. As I said, we've been running, I don't think your railroad is any different than any other railroad across this globe, but they're all running with an antiquated IT architecture. So the positioning uh, paradigm shifts have taken place, and positioning, of course, is track circuit, GPS, communications, wireless voice to wireless data. IT processing with PTC, we've now gone from back office to onboard. Integrate, not to, but including onboard. But the IT architecture now is shifting from something called CITAS. Uh, that happens. That's where that confusion and inefficiency comes in when you don't have exactly the same information you're dealing with. Let me step through this quickly. So here's an example. When I was developing, uh, when we had developed CT, uh, PTC for CSX, we had a, a test bed. And uh, it was dark territory. And we invited the FRA suppliers, a whole bunch of executives, and they had the, the car set up where they all sat back and watched the videos, the car went on, the train went on the track. We gave the information, or I should say the FRA gave permission to the engineer to go through his, past his malpost, which was malpost B. So the engineer's moving his train down the lot track. What we didn't know was that the malpost, for some unknown reason, had been moved two weeks earlier up like 500 feet. So PTC had that green milepost, but the actual milepost was red. So what happened? The train went past, and everybody's looking at through the theater car, and they go, there goes milepost B. Because same information, but different values. The system that PTC went to was not the system that the track department had updated on their track charts or whatever methodology they had used. There's a safety example, but think about it from an efficiency standpoint of not knowing where your trains are. Or interconnect, interchange between railroads, which is a major part of our industry. You don't see that in Europe, but in our industry, interchange is a major issue. Where's that UP train that I've been waiting for at CSX so I can keep my schedule, or try to keep my schedule? That's an, in, an industry perspective of EITA, and that's totally lacking. I'm not going to take you through the steps, but uh, basically, I'll say this. Developing EITA is a classic methodology that's been used, been around since the 70s. The underlying, I mean, consulting firms have their own name, but the IBM approach is called business systems planning. I've used that now for 40 years in various modes. But what it does is simply says, rethink your business processes. Reth something single source of truth. Maybe people have heard of SSOT. What that says is there's only one process that's going to develop that particular data point. Other people may try, but no, you ignore those people. And if somebody else needs it, then they come to that single source of truth. That's what we're talking about here. Okay. So where are the railroads that can use VCTC? 
Some of you guys may be looking at your CTC, if you have it, saying, you know, uh, it's getting a little bit old. I want to go from physical to microprocessor, if you haven't already. There's a good excuse to go to the VCTC. We're well, all probably looking for less expenditures on maintenance and capital expenditures. So another reason to look at VCTC. You may be out of capacity with dark territory. VCTC essentially is a dark territory. It's just a very smart one, okay? Again, it's... It's like auto routing for CTC. Your back office vitality, instead of having that conflict checker, it's also looking at where the trains are and setting up the routes. And I don't know who, which operators here are required to put in PTC, but if you're looking for PTC type functionality for your own reasons, then that's another way, another reason to put it in. When? It's actually available now. All right? The PCTC has been installed in Mozambique, Australia, going into Kenya. It's not necessarily the same one that you guys would use if you went after it, but is of that nature that I'm talking about. It has the generic aspects of what I've been talking about. But when in the U.S., now here's the kicker, guys. The union's going to fight it, right? Reduces one hell of a lot of maintenance. But here's, I think, the primary issue is that you're going to have a hard time finding a supplier that's going to do it. The guys you know aren't going to touch it because it's cheap. But it also requires, tech, not technicians, it requires technologists in that, technologists, the individual, as I said earlier, understands technologies but can also make the business case. But here's the real key. Executive management does not get involved with its technologists or with their technicians. There's a great article on Harvard Business Review, uh, November 2002. It's called The Six IT Decisions an IT Decision Maker Shouldn't Make. Great article. You can take that same article and say wireless data instead of IT. The point is that management, executive management, lets their technicians do what they do without challenging them. PTC is so freaking expensive and it doesn't need to be. It could be a hell of a lot less expensive if management got involved. And by the way, if, uh, if you want to challenge me on that, go to my blog, which I'll list here earlier, and I have a number of articles in this. The ITC committee blew it. They made it much more expensive than, than, than what I had designed because executives weren't asking, why are we putting in Interim singles, why are we monitoring ISs? There's no reason to do that, but yet they did, 35. Why are we going with 220? Because you all may not know about this, but they put a whole new wireless data network in without proving it was necessary. Okay, so you get my point. Executives need to be involved. So closing, uh, I give a lot of presentations. I have my own courses, which I'll show you in a moment. But one of the things I like to talk about is what I call the teddy bears. So I haven't been doing this for a long time. I run into a lot of statements that people think are true. They like to justify the position with it, and they're not true. So when I start my course, I list out, I'm only going to list a couple here. And at the end of the course, I say, let's knock down those little teddy bears. So let's, let's start with a couple right here. PTC is vital. Maybe you all hear that, have heard that. PTC is not vital. It doesn't generate authorities. PTC provides business benefits. No, how can it? If it doesn't generate authority, then it can prove traffic management, right? That's wrong. PTC needs to enforce interim singles. This was designed by a single engineer who thought you know, ISs were the most important thing in the world. But if you're already monitoring the control point for enforcement, why do you need to know the, I the IS is good for the driver? In, uh, screw it, engineer. In, in Europe, we call them drivers. So that's not true. Singles are, <laughs> so this course I teach, my basic course I teach to a lot of conventional suppliers. About two hours into the course, these are CTC suppliers, right? So about two hours into the course, I start talking about dark territory, and I say to them, what's vital in dark territory? And they're thinking equipment, right? Equipment, track search. And they say there's nothing vital, because they don't understand the functional aspect of vitality. Singles are installed not for safety, but they're installed for 
business purposes, because I can run, you can run a safe railroad without singles. So you put singles in for throughput. So what your executives need to know, hey, is there another way to get throughput without singles? The answer is yes. There's no vitality in dark territory. That's the point I was going to make. No, nah, there is. It's called a conflict checker. That's your vitality. Dispatcher is not vital, by the way, unless he or she does something contrary to the traffic control system that that person is using. Then he becomes spotted. A lot of people have been upset about precision schedule railroading. I've been promoting this for two decades, not the same way they've implemented it. And they said, because shippers can be upset. Yeah, of course they're going to be upset, because the shippers had the railroads any way they wanted them, as far as setting up trains and so forth. But that's changing now, folks. UP signing up, NS, BNSF is the hardcore guys. They're not quite there yet. They will be eventually, because they're going to have to be if they want to have good connection between railroads. Uh, the 220 meg, okay, that's the spectrum. That's that spectrum that they put in for absolutely no reason I can think of. Okay, thank you for your attention. For further insight about VUR, I suggest uh, you may, well, I have a suite of courses I teach if you want to, and I teach it for both at three different levels, executive, middle, and technical. Technical technologists. I have a professor. I'm starting down a path now of teaching professional courses for PEs. And the first one is going to be in the University of Delaware, where PEs can come in and get their qualifications, their ongoing education credits. Um, I encourage you to go to my blog. You'll find a lot of hits there on things a lot of people don't like to talk about. On the right side of the homepage is a category of things that you can check. Uh, some of you may have read the article called Going Virtual and to September Issue, Railway Age, and that will kind of encapsulate the number of things I said today. I sell no products. I'm an independent consultant. Whoever my client is, is my only client. Okay? So I have the great opportunity of maintaining my integrity. There's no conflict of interest in what I do. So lastly, that's my contact information. I have, unfortunately, I have to leave here shortly. And I encourage you to um, contact me if you have any questions. I would absolutely welcome that opportunity to have further discussions with you all. With that, thank you so much.